Okay, welcome everybody to the seventh Kumi Now online session. My name is Rochelle Friesen and I am the Canada Coordinator for Christian Peacemaker Teams. Uh, we work in partnership with Sibyl in Jerusalem, as well as Zokrot, who we'll be hearing from later today. Christian Peacemaker Teams uh, strives to build partnerships to transform violence and oppression. And as such, we have peace and human rights teams on the ground around the world. And our team in Hebron has been there since 1995. Myself, personally, I spent five years doing peace and human rights work in Palestine, where I got to know Sabil and Zohrot quite well. Sabil gave me a foundational understanding in what Palestinian liberation theology looks like. I was able to worship with them um, in their office. I attended their events, their conferences, and took part with, um, with delegations uh, to do the Stations of the Cross and got a really solid understanding of how to be an international ally with the Palestinian struggle. I also, during that time, got to know Zohrot this relationship has been very important for me. Uh, I consider myself to be a white settler living in Toronto on Turtle Island, also known as Canada. Uh, and my relationship with Sokrot helped me open my eyes, not just to how Israel is erasing the Palestinian history and existence in Palestine, but also how my own state uh, how Canada, how the Canadian government is erasing Indigenous history here on this land. And so it's very exciting uh, that we can have this discussion here today, uh, hosted by Sibyl and hearing from Zokro. And hopefully it will not only help us understand how we can work for justice in Palestine, but also how we can work for justice within our own community. So before we begin, there's a few housekeeping points I want us to cover so everything can run smoothly. Just to let everybody know that this session is being broadcast live on Facebook. So if you don't want your video or your face to be seen in that live footage, if you move your button over your screen and move to the bottom left hand corner, there's a stop video button. Click on that and no one will be able to see your face. We would also love it if you could quickly share the Facebook post um, onto your own Facebook post so that many more people will have an opportunity to learn and share in this discussion. Also, just to let everybody know, we will be muting. You will be muted throughout the entire session, except for those who are speaking. If you do wish to speak, if you move your, again, if you move your mouse over to the participants button, and you click on it, on the bottom, once you click on it, on the right hand side, there should be a raise hand option. Uh, so we're going to be doing virtual hand raising, not physical hand raising. Uh, so you can take a look at that. Uh, or you can always indicate in the chat to the Kumi team option. So if you click on the chat button right beside the participant button, you'll see on the bottom right hand side, there's a two button. You can click on who you want to chat to, click on Kumi team, and you can ask uh, questions there or, uh, or indicate if you're having any technical difficulties. At the end of our sharing today, there will be a time for questions um, or we'll be answering questions received earlier by email. If you have any technical issues, please use the chat to message Kumi team privately and we will try and help you as soon as possible. So we hope that you will find this session interesting and informative, and I'd like to start off by having everyone who will be speaking today uh, introduce themselves. So we'll begin with Abdullah Awad. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Abdullah Awad. I am a member of uh, Al Sabil uh, General Assembly, um, as well as uh, the director of uh, Dr. Hannah Marshaw's office. Uh, member of the PLO Executive Committee. Uh, I'm happy to be with you here. Um, and I'm going to provide you with a general update about um, what's going on in Palestine. Uh, 
Palestine is uh, at a turning point at the moment. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic is spiking in Palestinian cities, villages, and refugees camps. Uh, while Israel continues its legal theft and annexations of what's left of West Africa. As for COVID-19, I'm going to provide you with some numbers, um, just in you know, a short brief. Um, as, as for today, this morning, there were at least over 7,700 uh, cases of the virus in the West Bank, East Jerusalem, and Gaza. Uh, out of that number, uh, only 1,300 patients, a little over, uh, were in recovery. Um, of the active cases, uh, we have around um, 1,000, over 1,000 in Jerusalem, uh, eight in Gaza, and Hebron remains to be the epicenter of the outbreak with over 4,400 uh, active cases of the virus. Unfortunately, 45 people have died uh, from the virus, and to be honest, the situation is not getting any better, and the numbers are uh, rising daily. Uh, with ventilators at all hospitals uh, op operating in full capacity. Um, you know, the, the, the outbreak of the virus uh, has proven to be quite challenging for the Palestinian government and the Palestinian people. You know, we are under occupation, as you know, and, you know, executing a successful uh, policy uh, to combat and fight the outbreak of the virus is not an easy task, and sometimes it's impossible. Uh, when Israel controls the land, the ports of entry, um, the resources, the control, how we live, how we, how we move, um, and how we, you know, they control even our time, um, it makes it hard for the Palestinian government and the people to, um, curb the, uh, um, to curb the outbreak of the violence in, 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 in the West Bank. Um, some places are actually also, it's very hard to reach, so we are, and, and you know, this, this, uh, this outbreak also and the shutdown uh, that uh, the government enforced and the West Bank has also affected our ailing economy. And if you, if you put things in perspective, actually, uh, it will make us understand why the Palestinian healthcare system is actually crippled and uh, dysfunctional. Um, as you know, Palestine has been under foreign rules uh, for most of the time, uh, which did not really focus on uh, social welfare. Uh, so this, you know, impacted um, de developing a successful healthcare system for the benefit of the Palestinian people. And I want to note here that Jerusalem has uh, the best hospitals, um, um, you know, um, well equipped compared to other um, uh, cities uh, of the West Bank, uh, and which is meant to serve uh, Palestinian people, but unfortunately it's off limits uh, for most Palestinians. Uh, the other issue I want to talk about is the annexation. You know, it's, it's a hot topic right now. But, you know, as you know, technically, um, the West Bank is annexed by Israel. Um, as you know, the annexation is not something new. It's the essence of the uh, Zionist co uh, settler colonial project to superimpose greater Israel on historical Palestine. You know, it started with Jerusalem in the 80s and its neighborhoods. Also, the same thing happened with the Golan Heights. Uh, they continue with uh, the construction of settlements on Palestinian land, which is also a form of uh, annexation. But the issue here and the veracity here is that Israeli leaders are uh, going forward and moving ahead with a formal and official annexation uh, without even worrying about any consequences or damages from the international community. Uh, international community actually helped Israel to continue with its violation by turning a blind eye on its actions against the Palestinian people. Um, annexation is not only about land, to be honest, it's, it's, it's about dignity as well. When you annex any territory, uh, you deprive its population from the connection they have developed for the land. And they will eventually, eventually become uh, prisoners in uh, Bantu stands under Israeli full uh, control. The right of self-determination granted by the international community and by international law to all uh, nations would actually be uh, uh, deprived. Um, when the Palestinians accepted the two-state solution, it was a, a painful compromise, to be honest, to have a Palestinian state on 22% of historical Palestine. But they did it so for the sake of peace. They did it so by promises from, uh, based on promises from the international community that things will get better. But, you know, as time goes, it was pretty obvious that the two-state solution was, has never been on the Israeli agenda, even during the prolonged peace talks, that, you know, endless negotiations. Um, Israel continues with its annexation and violations with impunity and full support of the U.S. administration. The international system, which is now shifting to the right, 
as I had actually uh, created the cover for Israel to proceed with its agenda. The Arabs are divided and you know, preoccupied with the internal issues. Unfortunately, with some you know, of them look up to Israel as a partner. Um, and, the EU, and the EU is only you know, showing statements and not taking any serious steps to since the Palestinians are left alone. But you know, I'm, not, I'm not worried that a silence and determination of the Palestinian people not to give in will be the corner store of any uh, stone of any efforts that aim uh, to deny and erase their existence. Uh, we also noticed the rise of changing of public opinions um, in the West, also in the USA, among uh, minorities, uh, grassroots organizations, students, and uh, academics. So this is, you know, uh, will give us a source of hope that uh, someday um, the will of the people will be translated into uh, actions. You know, Palestine is part of the international system. When the system ignores Palestinian rights, uh, there is something wrong with, with that system. It's a collective responsibility to enforce a law-based international order. And um, annexation, if, you know, if, if such a fifth is accepted, you know, when an annexation, no country is uh, protected uh, at home. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Abdella, for that very, very important update. Uh, <clears throat> so today we are going to be hearing from Zohro. Uh, and so today we are going to learn about the right of return and the Jewish National Fund, also known as the JNF. This is more than just a learning opportunity though today. And so for those who don't know the name Kumi now, uh, comes from the word kumi in Arabic, which means rise up. And the ultimate goal is to engage in advocacy for Palestine around the world. To this end, our kumi actions and hearing from organizations on what we can do to help them are critical pieces by which we will measure our success. So enjoy the session today, but also think about how you can take part and engage with Sokrot and other organizations we work with. It might be, you might find creative ways to continue this advocacy and this engagement after the today's session, and it might be through a donation. It might be following groups on Facebook. It might be sharing articles and videos. It might be buying a book, signing a petition, uh, and keep working on sharing information about Kumi now far and wide. The more people that we reach, the greater impact we will have. So with that in mind, let's turn over to today's session as we partner with Sohrot and learn about the right of return and the Jewish National Fund. Uh, my good friend Omar Rubadi is going to share first. And Omar, I just ask that you give a brief introduction about yourself before, before you move into your formal presentation. Thank you, Omar, for being here today. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Sabil, for this opportunity to present the work of Zohrot. Uh, good evening, everyone, or morning, or good day. Depends where you are. Uh, my name is Omar. I'm Omar el -Ghubari. I'm a Palestinian that was born inside the state of Israel in a small village very close to Nazareth, um, one of these uh, villages that uh, survived 1948 events and uh, um, continued to uh, be existing in the same place and the same location that used to be for hundreds of years, unlike uh, some 600 other Palestinian villages that had been destroyed by the State of Israel and its people were expelled, uh, mainly in 1948, but not only in 1948. Uh, we will talk about the Nakba and the 1948 events, but for me, 1948, it's just a, uh, it's a term, it's a concept. The events, the occupations, and the expulsions of the Palestinian people uh, started before 1948 and continued many years after. And of course, we are witnessing uh, uh, different kinds of expulsion of Palestinian communities even in these days. So this is the meaning of ongoing Nakba and the, um, uh, the pressure against the Palestinian communities in different ways by the State of Israel and the Government of Israel is still ongoing till today. Um, 
Zohrot is a word in Hebrew that means remembering, was established in 2002 by Israeli Jewish activists. Um, by chance, they were my friends also. We used to work together in other places and other institutions. Um, uh, they realized that if we, as uh, uh, Palestinians and of course as Israelis, want to discuss our future in this landscape, we cannot go around ourselves and talk only about the occupation in once in, in the West Bank and Gaza in what's so-called the occupied territories uh, or the Palestinian occupied territories. Because the relationship and the power relation and the occupation by the Zionist movement and the State of Israel did not start in 1967. It started in 1948, even before that. But officially, uh, uh, the core of this conflict and the core of this story is 1948. And because of that, Zohrot works mainly among the Israeli Jewish society, doing that in Hebrew in order to let the people of uh, the, uh, the Israelis know about the Nakba and the events of the uh, 1948, because most of the Israelis will grow up in this country and uh, 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 will learn in the Israeli educational system without knowing almost nothing about the history of the Palestinian people and what happened to the localities that used to be existing in the same place that the State of Israel was uh, uh, established. I will share, sorry, I will share this, uh, some photos with you uh, uh, the same time when I explain the work of, uh, of Zohrot. So the, the main goal of Zohrot is to face the Israeli concepts and the Israeli uh, uh, policies in order to hide the information and the knowledge about the Palestinian people history and the Palestinian towns and villages that had been destroyed by the State of Israel. <clears throat> of course, when we talk about uh, facing the Israeli conceptions and perceptions, we talk about knowledge and we talk about responsibility and acknowledgement uh, by the Israeli side for what they did or their government or the state did to the Palestinian uh, people. Um, uh, so we talk about the uh, expulsion of more than 750,000 Palestinians in 1948 based on the Zionist perception that this land was empty and it will be prepared for people with no land uh, um, uh, during, the, uh, during the years. Uh, um, believing that uh, Palestinians who lived here, or they call them Arabs, uh, some uh, few tribes that came to this place uh, accidentally, and they, uh, uh, and they, and they, they never uh, uh, approached, or they never uh, considered the Palestinian people as people or as nations. So in my interpretation, it is easier to expel people that you don't believe that they are nation or belong to that place. Uh, so it was easy to destroy, for example, a beautiful city like Jaffa and to erase this neighborhood and to create the promenade of Tel Aviv on the beach of Tel Aviv. Thousands of people will walk and tour in this area without knowing that a beautiful neighborhood called Manchia was existing over there till 1948. Uh, or maybe they will live in an Israeli town and they are entering this synagogue without knowing that it was a mosque till 1948, like this one in Nestiona that was in the village of Wadi Hunain that was expelled in 1948. Or sometimes you will see beautiful houses, beautiful buildings, they will say, okay, this is very beautiful Arab house without knowing the real history and the real responsibility of the Israelis that expelled the family from this place. And in the same time, they will hide the identity of the, of the place or the house, like this uh, cover that you see hiding the, uh, the, some lines in Arabic in the village of Deryasin, which became a uh, neighborhood inside 
Jerusalem, West Jerusalem. Or, or Hebraizing the names on the streets and the landscape. Uh, this is a very funny one. Uh, they made a mistake in the beginning and they gave the same uh, uh, Arabic name of the village that was existing in the area called Annabi. You see it in English over here. And very soon they changed that to Anava. So if you uh, uh, understand Hebrew, you will see that this Anava sounds uh, 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 like a Hebrew name, not uh, a name in, in, in Arabic. So all these uh, uh, um, practices that Israel does and still doing against the identity of the landscape, um, for the Israelis, it's the default thing. This is the normal thing, and they, didn't, and they don't know uh, different history. We try to expose what is hidden in this landscape and what is the role of the Israeli government and the Israeli educational system and other institutions like the JNF. Uh, this one photo can express the destruction that happened in many places in, in, in Palestine, what became the state of Israel. And uh, after the destruction, uh, uh, the, the, the Hundreds of Palestinian names and Palestinian villages will disappear, of course, from the Israeli maps and also from the landscape. What we try as Zohrot in different tools, as I say, to expose and to tell the, uh, the facts regarding the Palestinian Nakba, uh, the first step we published this map having 600 names of destroyed Palestinian towns and cities and villages in Hebrew, and this will be the only map that Israelis, curious Israelis, who want to learn a little bit history, to know the names of the Palestinian uh, uh, villages and towns, and to learn where they live. Because every certain Palestinian town and kibbutz and city is necessarily built on a Palestinian destroyed locality. So this map will help. A uh, um, few years after that, we uh, uh, launched a very interesting app for smartphones called iNakba, and uh, it has the map of the all destroyed Palestinian villages. This map, every pin, every point over here is one of these destroyed Palestinian places. You can pick any one of them and you get the name of the place and information about it some photos and, every, and the research that we did as uh, Zohrot and other researchers. But what is interesting is this, this app could, use, could be used as a GPS. You can ask for directions and it will take you to a non-existing place. This is the only GPS in the world that will take you in a place and you will reach your destination and you look around. It's not the same place that you wanted to to, to, to reach. So uh, uh, this action, taking the people with this GPS, with the information in their pocket or in their hands, looking for a hidden Palestinian place is one of the, of the goals of Zohrot and one of the tools that we try, we invite people to, uh, 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 to look for the, the truth and the history. Among the 600 Palestinian uh, uh, localities that had been destroyed, uh, there are about 100 hidden inside the JNF forests. The JNF is a very strong and racist institution that was established in 1901 as part of the Zionist movement and the Zionist movement companies and institutions. Uh, uh, the goal of the JNF is to release or to free the Jewish land and to keep it only for the Jewish people. And for today, inside the state of Israel, they own 13% of the land of the state of Israel. And in their goals and in their principles that this land should serve and the benefit of this land should go only to Jewish families and Jewish persons. Even I, as an uh, Israeli citizen, I have an Israeli citizenship, uh, according to the JNF rules, uh, I don't deserve any support or 
uh, any benefit from this land. It's only for the Jewish, pure for the uh, uh, Jewish uh, uh, people, the Jewish land, for the Jewish families, the Jewish students, and uh, uh, it must be uh, like that. And it's still going till today. And by the way, it's written in their website. It's very clear that it's normal. This is okay. They didn't even uh, realize how racist this approach or how uh, um, uh, unfair this uh, uh, approach. The parts of the JNF are uh, uh, different. They have about 70 parks and forests around the country. And uh, some of them will be named following some of the Israeli leaders or Zionist figures, but uh, they will also involve the whole nations, I think, in the Western world. Uh, many forests are called or named uh, by the names of the countries, your countries, like Canada, United States, uh, Britain, France, all of you are involved in the without knowing that in the crimes of the of the JNF. Uh, this is the entrance of Canada Park in uh, uh, the, the center of the country between Jerusalem and Tel Aviv. And uh, uh, the JNF themselves are aware that the forests are hiding um, the ruins of Palestinian uh, villages and towns. And uh, this quote, you can see it by uh, Michal Kotorza. She was in charge of the JNF uh, um, uh, in a few years ago. And she said many of the, many of the JNF or Kakal in Hebrew uh, parks are located on land where Palestinian villages once stood. The forests are there to conceal this. So this awareness of the JNF of their role as a, 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 a patriotic is known for them. Bohrot started to organize tours to the destroyed Palestinian villages from the beginning of its uh, uh, establishment. And the first tour was to Canada Park. Canada Park is easier for the Israelis to understand or to come and to express solidarity because it is located inside the occupied territories because it was occupied in 1967. Zohrot dealing with what happened in 1948 and visiting and trying to visit all the destroyed uh, villages inside uh, uh, what was uh, captured in 1948. Uh, Canada Park is easier for many Israelis to come, even Zionist leftists can come to Canada Park and to feel uh, 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 sorrow that uh, this happened to the Palestinians in 1967. So the tour there uh, uh, um, uh, raised the question why the JNF doesn't put the names of the Palestinian history, the Palestinian villages and don't mention the Palestinian history. And it's common in 95% of the JNF parks. They even don't say what was here till 1948 or what, what was here before the, the forest was planted. Uh, uh, we sued the JNF and we uh, uh, even sent some letters by a lawyer asking them why you don't put the names of the villages of Emwas and Yalu and Beit Nuba in Canada Park. And we got an answer saying that is a political issue and we don't deal with politics, which is very funny that every, everything the JNF doing in this landscape is, is uh, political, but when it is, uh, um, uh, when we talk about the Palestinian history and the Palestinian name, so it's political and they don't want to deal with these uh, political issues. Uh, so we thought that it deserves to call for action uh, to do something as Zohrot, inviting Israelis and other uh, uh, activists, internationals and Palestinians in order to expose what the GNF insisting to hide. And uh, uh, all the tools that we uh, do, we bring signs and we put signs on the place. Of course, someone will come a few days or sometimes a few hours after our tour and will uproot the, uh, the sign again. 
by the way, we believe that this action that when we put a sign and someone will come approaching the sign, it's, it's, it's kind of, of action that we moved the JNF officer or some Israeli tourists who are coming to the area and they don't want to see different history or different names and they're doing that by their own hands. They approach the sign in order to take part in hiding the history. Um, uh, one of the uh, uh, main actions that we did uh, um, um, this year was uh, uh, a whole day tour visiting different parts of the JNF and uh, uh, um, exposing the history under the trees or among the trees and uh, putting the signs with the names of the original Palestinian villages that used to be there in that, in that park. This, for example, the uh, British Park. This is Robin Park. And the list has the names of, these, of the uh, not existing Palestinian places. Uh, in Shemin, uh, in the center of the country near Led and Ramle, uh, one of the biggest forests uh, in the country. The British, the United States Independence, Independence Park with the list of these Palestinian uh, hidden uh, 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 villages, Begin Park, and here you can see a photo of Israelis that came with us in this action, uh, putting the sign that we prepared very close to the sign of the JNF in order to tell different story for the people. One of the uh, uh, really exciting actions following the JNF uh, uh, violation happened in a park in a forest named uh, uh, South Africa Forest. It's in the Galilee and it's hiding one of the biggest Palestinian villages called Lubia uh, that was expelled in 1948. Some group from uh, Jewish group from South Africa came to visit South Africa Forest. And during the tour with the JNF uh, uh, um, uh, hosts, uh, they saw ruins of a Palestinian village and a cemetery. And they asked what these uh, ruins are doing here and what is the history of these uh, ruins. Uh, um, they didn't get answers. And they had the feeling that there's some story that the, uh, the JNF people hiding of them. So the next step was is to make a research about the South Africa forest and the area in the Galilee and they found that their money that they donated to the JNF, JNF is collecting money from the Jewish communities in every place almost, not only Jewish. Their money was used or actually misused by the JNF in order to hide a Palestinian village and to stop the return of the refugees of this of this village, so they are uh, uh, they really were uh, very active in this field, and they uh, sent letters to the JNF, and they organized uh, a big group uh, from the uh, uh, Jewish community in South Africa. They contacted the refugees of Lubia, and they uh, came and also contacted Zohrot, and we all went together to the uh, village and we uh, conducted a ceremony of apology that uh, the, uh, the South African Jewish group came with about 200 signed pledges, the pledge that you see over here, as a Jewish person uh, asking uh, um, the, the, the refugees of Lubia to understand the whole picture that they didn't mean to uh, uh, take their land or that it was not on their names. Actually, it wasn't their names, but they didn't know, didn't know about it. Uh, so this was one of the most exciting uh, ceremonies that we managed to do in the, among the ruins of Lubia. Uh, 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 as I said, about 200 people were there. Some of them are uh, uh, Palestinian refugees of the village. Others were Israelis by Zohrot and others from the Jewish community from South, South Africa. So it, this one of the actions that we, that truly we can say, we can point that this uh, uh, a very good achievement of Zohrot in order to change something in the knowledge 
of the people and the willing of these people to make an action in order to expose uh, the truth. Um, uh, I know that my time is over, but I just, I, I'll do that very short in two minutes. One of our main projects in these years as a whole is to uh, promote a discussion and ideas about the implementation of the return of the Palestinian refugees. We have uh, uh, workshops for uh, different groups, Palestinians, Israelis, and mixed groups. We invite researchers and experts to give ideas how uh, uh, the return could be implemented. Since Zohrot supporting fully the right of the Palestinian refugees, uh, um, 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 but we add one more question, how it could be implemented on the ground. And we raise questions uh, in order to help ourselves and people who believe in the, uh, the right to return uh, uh, to imagine the future, including the, the return of the Palestinian refugees. So these some of the products that some workshops, Palestinian youth uh, suggesting to rebuild their own destroyed village, their destroyed place, in order to, uh, uh, to make the imagination not only the in theory, not only just imagination, but also part of their existence and political actions. Thank you very much. I'm sorry for taking time. Thank you so much, Omar. I am continued to both be humbled and inspired by your work. Um, if you ever study, if folks ever study settler colonialism, part of the settler colonial project is for settlers to erase the original indigenous identity and then plant on top uh, the settler identity. And so I find what you are doing, Omar, is really revolutionary and taking that decolonial spirit into the future. So thank you for that. Uh, yeah. We will now invite Rachel to speak. And Rachel, if you could please uh, just introduce yourself briefly before you begin your part of um, the presentation. Sure. Thank you, Omar, for this presentation. And thank you, Sabil, for having us here. Um, it's, it's a privilege to be here. Uh, my name is Rachel, Rachel uh, Betarie. I am Israeli, uh, daughter and granddaughter uh, of settlers who came here from Eastern Europe, mostly. Uh, and I am, uh, for the past two years, the general director of the Hot. And um, I was asked to share a personal story and I was thinking longer and hard what story uh, to share with you. And I will share a story uh, that was part of my political awakening that is frankly a little bit embarrassing to me. Um, but working with embarrassment and uh, feeling of shame um, for example, when you find out that you live on the ruins of a Palestinian village that in many lovely picnics in those same forests that, um, that Omar just showed you and never realized what they really were. Uh, so these are feelings of embarrassment, shame, and wanting to uh, stay in denial. And these are the feelings uh, that we work with at the court um, to change Israeli society and to decolonize ourselves, our hearts and minds. So um, the story happened almost 20 years ago, the same year that the court was founded and had nothing to do with the court. Uh, the same year I was going to China, um, traveling and then working there for many years. And my travels took me to Beijing, and after many months uh, away and living Chinese food, um, I was going to eat on an Arabic restaurant in Beijing uh, with no political intention whatsoever, something I probably wouldn't do today, uh, but did then, and I was having a very nice uh, dish of hummus. And, I, uh, um, and the waitress, the Chinese waitress, uh, told me that the cook, the chef, was Palestinian and would you like to meet him? And I was not really because that's embarrassing, but he was already there. 
Um, and I assumed he was from the West Bank, but no, he was a Palestinian born in Syria uh, to a family of refugees and told me immediately that he was from Safat in the Galilee. Um, and heard I was Israeli and asked me if I've ever been in Safad and um, I told him I was, of course. And he asked me, could you just tell me, describe to me what it's like, what it looks like? Um, and that was kind of shocking to me and I did my best and it was a very strange conversation in uh, a few words of Arabic and broken English and broken Chinese. Uh, to try to describe uh, that landscape that uh, I knew very well and was missing for about a year that I was away from home uh, and for him he was missing all his life and couldn't actually see and go back there um, and he tried to tell me how much um, he grew up on his family's stories from Sefad and how much he wanted to go back there and it just came out that I told him, well, I hope you will go back someday and will return. And I wasn't that politically aware at the time. I don't think I ever thought about the right to return uh, as a real political option, um, but it seemed so um, common sense to me at that point. Why wouldn't this man have the right to just return home? which is the basic right of everyone. Um, and I would have loved to leave this story as is um, and as kind of a feel good story, uh, but there is another part to it. So we parted and I was boarding a very long um, train ride uh, that night. And when we parted, he said, hang on a minute and went into the kitchen and brought back more hummus for your train ride, please. Um, absolutely refused to get paid for that. Okay, I took it and uh, I went back to the hostel where I was staying and just before I left the city, uh, I met a group of uh, other Israelis who were traveling and I of course was very happy to meet them uh, as you are in a foreign land, uh, speaking your own language. All of a sudden after many months and uh, I was telling them what excited and moved uh, about this encounter and one of the guys said jokingly um, well you're not gonna eat it right he probably poisoned this hummus and I think this moment came back to me and kept coming back to me for years after that because the abyss between um, this man who was supposed to be enemy and was friendly and generous and curious and those people who were supposed to be my own people and were just hateful and, and racist in this um, casual everyday racism that maybe I wouldn't have noticed that much um, a year or two before but some time away from home made me notice this incredible gap and uh, this need that we have to dehumanize and to uh, suspect and to see every Palestinian act as an act of terrorism in order to defend the undefensible. Um, and this was something that just came back to me um again and again and as i worked my way towards uh, activism and activism for return and it's something that i try to to project to other israelis the way we talk about palestinians and why we do that uh in order to deny basic rights and can we let go of this and can we think of another path a common sense path and a just solution that includes the right to return. Um, so that's the story and these are the uh, materials that we work for in the hot first and foremost.
to work with settlers, with Israelis, um, and to do a work of decolonization right here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rachel, for your story. And I think you, you've really drawn on some really important points around like, as, as someone that perhaps comes from the oppressor class uh, in the country, having to deal with feelings of embarrassment, having to deal with feelings of shame, but not being stuck in that, that we have to take a step to decolonize ourselves um, and become accomplices in the decolonization project. Uh, so thank you so much for your words. We will now move into a time of questions. Uh, so please feel free to write your question in the chat uh, and we will see how many we can answer. I'm not seeing very many questions come in. Um, so I will ask a quick question um, and it's for either Omar or for Rachel. How can, what should we be doing um, in our countries where we are, if we're, if we're not uh, from, from, if we're not living in Palestine, um, what should we be reading and looking for? trying to add. okay um i think there's a lot that you can do um the stop the jnf campaign was mentioned before in the uk uh there is another campaign that i i know of in canada by independent jewish voices that is ongoing uh, to defund the jnf to take their uh, uh tax benefits away i think that's very important uh, and raise awareness in your communities, especially if you belong to any Jewish communities, because I think the legitimization of the State of Israel um, comes in, to a large part from uh, Jewish communities abroad on, and their support of Zionism. Um, and taking that away is very meaningful for us and, and, and helping us uh, doing our own work of pushing um, Jewish people in here in Israeli society um, towards a different and bet better political path. Um, so find out what campaigns are ongoing, uh, support Palestinian-led campaigns, um, and share this knowledge in your communities. Thank you. May I add a few words if you wait for me? Yeah, I just uh, I agree with I agree with Rochel. Uh, you I assume you you all know that in situation of violation and uh, uh, racism, um, moral people could not be and should not be neutral. You cannot say okay, I'm uh, I'm not taking side because the silence is taking side with the violation. Actually, it's uh, it's giving uh, uh, a permit for continuation of the of the same uh, uh, racist situation. I think the uh, um, more and more people um, discuss and open these issues will be very helpful for our work as Zohrot because we believe that what is ongoing. Uh, and the international community will come as a boomerang also to the Israeli society and we can use that to make more uh, uh, pressure. Uh, the, uh, the second point is um, uh, using the correct and uh, uh, accurate and precise terminology and language. I know that most of the international community talking about uh, two neighbors and Palestinians and Israelis negotiating for uh, some agreement for peace. 
but I think they missed the point and we, we, we should emphasize that we are talking about the need of decolonization, desionization, uh, because Zionism is, is the core of this uh, situation. It's not only the, um, the misunderstanding between the Palestinians and their neighbors, uh, the Israelis, uh, uh, since 1967, as I said in the beginning. Thank you so much. So another question is, if most Palestinian refugees were to return, how many would that be? And has Zohrot have any ideas how many, like how do we settle that many people or what are, what's the data you're working with? Uh, Omar, maybe you want to answer that? Yeah, I can start. Uh, we don't know how many really Palestinian refugees will return but uh, we, we, we don't ask this question. Our assumption, our basic assumption that we should work in the, uh, uh, um, in the principle that this right uh, um, must be given to the whole Palestinian refugees, refugees and they will decide whatever to do with that right. Um, uh, I hope that all of them will, will come back. But to be realistic, and uh, we try to learn from experiences of other nations and other people usually uh, uh, return, even it was open for all refugees, uh, um, some of them deciding not to come back. But I still assume uh, that most of the Palestinian refugees will return. We ask uh, Palestinians in the refugee camps. We have contacts with Palestinian refugees in Lebanon and in other places. Even Palestinians who are living already in Europe are still waiting for their return. Um, um, so I, th I don't have exact numbers, but I, I still believe that the majority will do that. If there's a space for them, of course. Uh, usually we face this question from Israelis, by the way. Many Israelis will ask, but there is no room over here. By the way, the Israelis are, uh, um, the, the, according to the Israeli law, they have to accept any Jewish person who is living in the world if they decide or she or he decides to uh, immigrate uh, to the state of Israel. And uh, they never asked if there is a room or, or space uh, uh, for these Jewish uh, immigrants if they decide to do so. I believe the, the question is not a, space, it's a, a political uh, willing and political uh, question. And uh, uh, it doesn't mean that it will be easy and smooth. Of course, we, we have challenges with this uh, uh, return. And this is the idea beyond the project of imagining the return and uh, planning the return. We really put questions that uh, um, uh, are asking uh, um, and or raising good points that I believe that the Palestinian refugees themselves didn't think about them and I don't blame them because they want to return, but they didn't ask the questions how to return and where to return, what to do with the Israeli uh, current situation. Big cities were built in some of the villages, uh, um, some universities or institutions, what to do with them. Uh, do we have different point of views or different ways uh, of return, which is very interesting issue that Palestinian refugees from a the Aida camp in Bethlehem raised up and they said, we are willing to think about different uh, returns. It's not only one return. Uh, it, I don't see any uh, reason why to destroy the University of Tel Aviv, for example, in order to rebuild the village of Sheikh Mwannis. But we need the acknowledgement that the university was built in our land and we are willing to think how to do that, how to, what kind of contract we can sign with the university and we will build the village in the closest area or the most uh, 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 proper area in the, in, in the land of the, of the village. By the way, all the Palestinian villages didn't have only what was built area. It's not only the location of the houses. They had a wide land around the village and the village could be built, if it's not possible in the exact location, could be built in uh, uh, in the in the wide land very close to the village. Thank you, Omar. Unfortunately, we only have time for one more question. However, feel free to stay beyond the official session uh, for a time of more questions there. 
So the last question we'll ask for now is how much resistance are you getting from the Israeli government or are you getting any repression from the Israeli authorities? Um, yeah, well, we get a lot of resistance uh, from the government, but also from the wider society. Uh, our idea that for me, again, it just common sense and, and basic principles of human rights uh, that refugees uh, should be allowed to return home. Uh, but these ideas are considered radical for some reason. Uh, and we get um, harassment sometimes on the tours when we take people uh, to destroyed localities like uh, you saw uh, at Omar's presentation. Um, the police would sometimes um, try to ask us not to do that. Uh, or come and follow us. And sometimes private citizens would just be uh, unhappy of us uh, doing that. Uh, one time, uh, Zohrot activists were uh, wanted to do an action in Tel Aviv on the Israeli Independence Day Eve. And the police uh, circled the offices and would not let people out. Um, we have to remember that um, this, these harassments are minor compared to what uh, Palestinians, especially in the West Bank and Gaza, uh, are going through. Um, however, we do see an increased delegitimization uh, within Israel from the government, from the society, sorry, um, towards any kind of human rights advocacy and definitely towards um, the actions of Zahrot calling for acknowledgement of the Nakba and right to return. And, and, and the more uh, we spread the knowledge and more people are aware of the Nakba and many more people are aware of the Nakba thanks to the uh, ongoing work of Zahrot, um, the denial and the backlash and uh, those attempts uh, to silence are also getting more, more and more severe, uh, together with the uh, um, very sharp right turn of Israel. So it's an environment that is not hospitable uh, to these ideas. Um, nonetheless, we have to present these ideas and, and put them, them right here where the oppression and the colonization is happening and push towards um, a different future and a more just future. Thank you. And thank, thank you, you for everyone's, everyone's questions. questions. Thank you for the answers. Uh, this has been a great time uh, of learning together. We'll now turn to a time of reflection or prayer. Uh, and for this time, I invite you to get comfortable. Um, and I'm going to read a piece of literature by Mona Dorora. Uh, when I would become a bird. When I was young, I used to imagine that I was a small bird flying from one place to the other and landing wherever I like. I used to stand in front of the mirror and sing like a bird would do. I used to cut wings from paper, draw on my face to look like a bird and stand on the bed attempting to fly to the ground. My grandfather, who used to feel he was a tree planted in the land, always told me, become a planted tree because the land is everything for the human being. The person who doesn't have land is not a human being. If I were a tree, I would have stayed in Palestine. I used to tell him that I want to stay a bird and land on his shoulders. But he would yell at me saying, go away, you will break my branches. You are not a bird. My grandfather passed away, but I still feel like a bird. As I grew up, I started to realize that I could not be a bird because I am a Palestinian refugee. This meant I could not fly wherever I felt like because I had no land and eventually I had no identity. I began to realize how important it was for a person to have a land in which he is planted. But my land is there and I want to return to my land there in Palestine. I want to return so that I would have an identity like my grandfather had before leaving Palestine. 
I want to return, to be free to choose whether I want to be a bird, as I have always loved to be, or a tree, as my grandfather has always wanted me to be. So thanks again, everybody, for taking part in this wonderful session and for Rachel and Omar for all your wonderful information. Um, it is great for all of us to learn about the right of return and the JNF. But we at Kumi Now believe that knowledge is just the beginning. The reason that Kumi Now exists is to empower people to act on their knowledge. With this in mind, we've created a single advocacy action that anyone around the globe can participate in. And it will be posted in the chat and is also available on the website. So this week, we would like you to first watch The Village Under the Forest. It's a 54 minute documentary that tells the story of Wubya that Omar talked about previously. Uh, and the village is described, was described this morning and it will also be in the documentary. Screen it for your class, for your church, for your group, for your family, for your community, um, maybe your social distancing bubble, whatever your region is sort of doing right now. Now's the time to learn. And you can purchase the video online for less than $8 US, or you can rent it for $3 US, and all the links should be in the chat. But we're not going to stop by just watching the film. There's another thing we need to do. So Lubya, as you heard this morning, is just one of the many destroyed Palestinian villages that have been covered by the JNF forest. And they're funded by uh, many, by people all from all around the world. So if you look at these forests on Google Maps, you'll see reviews that praise these locations, that they're these wonderful, beautiful places, go ride your bike, go on a picnic, but there's nothing mentioned about the original villages. So this is where we come in. The stories, rights, and villages of Palestinians are being buried online just as they are in real life. So alert other travelers to the true stories of the lands they are using by leaving a review on Google Maps. So we would suggest you leave a one or two star review. I'd go with one, uh, but one or two star review and saying something like, what a beautiful area. But the truth is the forest was planted over destroyed Palestinian homes and villages and that, and is, land that rightfully belongs according to international law to those refugees and their descendants. I encourage everyone to urge the JNF to both acknowledge and right these wrongs so that Jews and Palestinians may live, as, live in peace as neighbors. So if you follow the link to the full action, you will find further information about Lavi, which is what Omar mentioned today, which is the South Africa forest, and about Canada Park, Canada's forest, the UK's, the United States donations, and how to leave reviews of the forest they have funded to cover up Palestinian villages. Finally, there is more information um, about Lifta. Uh, so Lifta is one of the only Palestinian villages to not be totally destroyed. It is now a park popular with Israeli citizens who like to swim in its pools. If you read the reviews, they are overwhelmingly positive with no mention of the injustice done to its owners. Uh, and the cleansing of uh, Lifta actually took place before 48. Um, if I understand correct, Omar, this is what you taught me. Um, so the link, there's a link in the chat uh, where there's a short film done by De Badil that you can watch called Sons of Lif Lifta. And you again can write reviews on Google Maps there. You can share photos of your screenings on Google Maps, uh, you can take your review, snap, uh, screenshot it, put it on your social media to show that you have done this action and include a link to this page uh, of Kumi Now website and also include the hashtags, hashtag Kumi Now and hashtag Kumi Now 39. So thanks again for everybody. Rachel and Omar, do you have any thoughts about this Kumi action that's taking place? Well, I would like to thank you again. I think it was very, very good uh, opportunity for Zohrot uh, to present the work for um, so many people. And uh, I hope, uh, as you said, Rochelle, that this information should not stop over here, it should be taken and uh, 
and be talking and discussed uh, uh, in every circle that we are involved in, in order to um, push more and more people towards making justice and making a return for the Palestinian people. Um, so yeah, really it was for me a very good opportunity and I, I hope that we dropped one more drop in the awareness regarding the Nakba and the return of the Palestinian people. Thank you, Omar. So thanks again for being with us today and next week, uh, we'll be joined by Pilgrims of Ibeline and the three-time Nobel Prize, Peace Prize nominee, the former Archbishop and founder of Mar Ilya Schools, Abuna Ilya Shakur. He and other guests will address the barriers to education that Palestinian children face, particularly around discriminatory funding practices. So we hope to see you all back next week. And if you like what you've seen today, we'd greatly appreciate it if you'd help us spread the word to your families to your family, your friends, classes, church groups, online groups through social media. You can share this webinar even after it's no longer being live streamed. So now we have reached the formal end of the meeting, but if you'd like to hang around, uh, our guests have offered to answer a few more questions and chat. And so this week we ask that anyone who wants to speak to please raise their hand and you can do so. Again, it's a virtual hand raising. You click on the participants button and then you'll see three buttons. One says invite, one says raise hand on the right hand side. That's how you virtually raise your hand. Um, and I will call upon you and you will have one minute to speak. Please ask that you don't give a lecture or a commentary, but ask a really nice but concise question. Uh, and we know, uh, so now is the time that we can hang out and chat and the formal uh, recording of this should be ending soon.